Okay, let's get started. Uh, we'll begin with singing number 122 in the supplemental hymnal, Why Do Heathen Nations Rage? Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your promise to undermine and, and bring to futility the conspiracies of, of your enemies. And we praise you that you have set your son on the holy hill, the great king, so that he will reign until all his enemies are made his footstool. So help us to rejoice as you uh, are filled with joy and blessedness day by day. Help us to rejoice so that we might rejoice uh, in the great victory that is to come and has been accomplished. Strengthen us now through, through this morning and help us to honor you and hear your word and receive it 
with love and trust so that we can practice it in our lives. For Jesus' sake, amen. amen. Okay, let me just quickly remind you about our question and answers. You've done a good job in getting these questions in, um, but we have that, we'll have one more session of that after our second uh, session this morning. Um, remember the books, and lunch will be served at 12.30 again. So that's what's happening. And now we get to hear Peter come and bring his last talk. Thank you, Peter. We'll please welcome Peter Lightheart again. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been looking at the early chapters of Acts, as you know, and we've been studying together what the early church was doing. My premise is that the church's mission is the politics of Christians. It's not some kind of private, purely spiritual mission and uh, to which we add political activity, but rather the church's mission is the carrying out of the kingship of Christ, the extension of the kingship of Christ, confronting the powers and principalities of the world. This is our politics. The church is our family. The church is our city. The church is our nation. And the church's mission is our politics. And under that general heading, I talked about the politics of the spirit on Monday uh, and the uh, central role of the Spirit in inspiring Christian activity in life. If we want to confront the challenges of our time, then we need to be acting and living and walking in the Spirit. Yesterday I talked about the politics of parasia, the free open speech of the apostles inspired by the Spirit. And that's what we're called to. We're called to name the name of Jesus and proclaim the name of Jesus. And especially we're called to do that in situations where we're under pressure and threats and uh, suppression when that when that name is suppressed when the when the rulers tell us not to name that name then we need the virtue of parasia in order to respond and continue speaking the name of Jesus in the face of human opposition we must obey god rather than men uh, today i want to talk about the economy of communion that develops within the early church. And to get us started, I'm going to read from Acts chapter 5, the story of Ananias and Sapphira. This is preceded by a, a few verses that we'll look at later that have to do with the practices of the early church in selling property and distributing the proceeds of that property to those who are needy within the church. But in chapter 5, we have this. A man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back, keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came over all who heard of it. The young men got up and covered him up, and after carrying him out, they buried him. Now there elapsed an interval of about three hours, and his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for, this, for such and such a price. And she said, Yes, that was the price. Then Peter said, why is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and over all those who heard of these things. Let's pray together. Father, you have shown great generosity to us. For our sakes, Jesus, who was rich, became poor, that we might become rich in him. We thank you that you blessed us immeasurably with material wealth, 
with the social wealth of peace, the social capital that we enjoy in this country. We pray that we would learn to use it well and follow the model and the example of your generosity in the way we manage and share our goods. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Acts replays the conquest of Canaan. You can set out the book of Acts next to the book of Joshua, and there are repeated connections between the two. The book of Joshua takes place immediately after Moses has died. Moses is the one who led Israel out of Egypt, of course, and brought Israel through the wilderness to the plains of Moab, just over on the other side of the Jordan from the city of Jericho. And then he disappeared. And Joshua, his successor, had to lead the people into the land. And you have a similar thing going on here in the book of Acts. Jesus appears briefly in person at the beginning of the book of Acts, and then he disappears, ascends to his father. And the mission is going to be carried out not by Jesus directly, but rather through his apostles. Before Moses disappears, he's already conferred a portion of his glory a portion of his spirit, a portion of his honor and prestige, if you will, on Joshua. That takes place in the book of Numbers. And so Joshua has already been selected and set out as the one who's going to succeed Moses and lead the people across the Jordan into the promised land. And when the book of Joshua opens, of course, Joshua does that. He continues the ministry of Moses, and you can look at the early chapters of Joshua, and you'll see that Joshua is not only, Joshua is repeating many many of the things that Moses had done. Uh, Moses divided the Red Sea. Joshua divides the Jordan River. Uh, Moses met the angel of the Lord at the burning bush. Joshua meets the captain of the Lord's hosts when he's going to lead the people into the land. Uh, Moses celebrates the Passover in Egypt. Joshua leads the people across the land, has them all circumcised, and celebrates the first Passover in the land. Because of the spirit of Moses that's been given to Joshua, Joshua becomes a kind of new Moses and carries on the work of Moses in now in a different setting, in a setting of conquest. And as we've seen over the last couple of days, that happens to the apostles also. Jesus disappears, but he gives his spirit to the apostles, and they continue to carry out the work of Jesus and the mission of Jesus and do the things that Jesus has done, and even, as Jesus promised, greater things than Jesus had done by the power of the spirit of Jesus. Joshua leads Israel through a mass baptism in the Jordan River, and the apostles lead a new Israel through a mass baptism on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 are baptized and brought into the church. Jerusalem is a kind of Jericho. There's an initial conquest of a great city when Joshua is conquering the land. That great city is brought down by the trumpets of the priests, by the shout of the people, And something similar is happening in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the Jericho. Some Rahabs within Jerusalem are being saved, but Jerusalem is going to be left behind, and ultimately it's going to be left desolate. It's going to be destroyed after a generation by the Romans. It's going to be like another Jericho. And all this, of course, is under the heading, uh, uh, under the rubric, under the, the parallel between Jesus and Joshua. Same name. Yeshua is the... Hebrew form of Jesus. Jesus is just the Greek form of Yeshua or Joshua. Not all the parallels between Joshua and the book of Acts are so positive, though. The passage that I've just read is another of the parallels between the book of Acts and the history of the conquest in Joshua. Ananias and Sapphira keep back a portion of the property, a portion of the wealth, the money that they receive from selling a piece of property. And uh, they lie about how much they're giving, how, what, what, uh, they lie about how much of the uh, money that they're uh, giving and bringing to the feet of the apostles, and they're struck dead. And that's repeating something that happened in the early chapters of Joshua. After Israel had conquered Jericho, they took a portion of the army and they went against the smaller city of Ai. They figured they could take the smaller city of Ai without the full army, It's a small city. It's not a powerful city like Jericho. And they attack the city of Ai, and the people of Ai come out and scatter the Israelite troops. And Joshua goes to the Lord, what happened? Why are we 
being defeated by this small city after we've defeated the great city. And the Lord says there's a sacrilege in the camp of Israel. Achan, a member of the tribe of Judah, had taken some treasure from Jericho, treasure that belonged to Yahweh, and hid it in his own tent. He took it as his own. He stole from God. That's what sacrilege is. You take holy things. Holy things are things that belong to God. And if you take holy things and make them your own and use them for your own purposes, then you're committing the sin of sacrilege. You're stealing from God. You're putting holy things to common use. And that's what Achan was doing. Ananias and Sapphira are doing something similar here. They're exposed immediately. Achan is eventually exposed through a series of lots. Ananias and Sapphira are exposed immediately. And Peter immediately knows that they're lying to the Holy Spirit. And they're immediately killed. Achan is killed after the defeat of Ai and then the exposure of his sin. And then he's killed along with all his family and buried under a pile of rocks to commemorate that event. To see the full import of what's going on with Ananias and Sapphira, though, we need to use another Old Testament overlay, not just the conquest, but we have to see the early chapters of Acts as a conflict and a contest between two temple systems. There's a battle of temples. There is the established physical temple in Jerusalem with all of its sacrificial practices, all of its zones of teaching, all of its other activities, its leaders and elites That's one system. And then by the gift of the Spirit to the apostles, they've been constituted as a temple, as a holy people, as the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And you have at the beginning of Acts, you have a conflict between these two temples. The old temple system is fading away. The new temple system is emerging. People are leaving the old temple system to join the new temple. We find out in Acts Acts 5 that even many priests have become faithful to the the church. They've become faithful to Jesus. We'll meet one of them. We'll meet a Levite in just a few moments. A Levite, part of the temple elite, that's now a follower of Jesus and has become part of this temple system. You have people transferring from one to the other. And with people, you also have wealth transferring from the temple system over to the church. This is a conflict in the temple, as we've seen over the last couple of days. Jesus took over the temple at the end of his ministry. The apostles are right back in the temple, carrying on the ministry of Jesus in the power of his spirit. They're doing exactly the things that Jesus had done in the temple, teaching the people, healing, casting out demons, doing all these things. Jesus was opposed in the temple, so are the apostles. They're arrested repeatedly. In the early chapters of of Acts, much of the action is taking place in the temple. And then as soon as Stephen dies and everyone scatters from Jerusalem, the temple simply drops out of the book of Acts. There are no references to the temple between Acts chapter 7, when Stephen is martyred, and when Paul gets back to Jerusalem and goes into the temple to fulfill a vow. That's the next time we see the temple in operation. This long gap in the, hist- in, the, in the account of Acts where the temple is just not in the picture. And it's intriguing that when we finally get to the end of the story of the temple in the book of Acts, it's when Paul is arrested in the temple, just as the apostles had been at the beginning of the book. There's a riot in the temple, and to prevent the riot from overflowing and getting out of hand, they close the doors of the temple. That's the last reference to the temple in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 21. Closed doors, riots going on in the temple, a foreshadowing of the temple's future. That's the last glimpse. Paul, who is in the temple, keeping the law, he's actually fulfilling a requirement of the law in the temple. He's arrested as a lawbreaker and taken out of the temple and put on trial, and then the rest of Acts is about Paul's trials. The temple is turned into its opposite. Instead of being a place that teaches the law of God, that encourages obedience to the law of God, the temple has become a a place where law-abiding Jews, like Paul, if they name the name of Jesus and still keep the law, they're going to be arrested and put on trial. It's It's a battle in the temple, 
in the early chapters of Luke. But it's also a battle about the temple and what the temple provides for the people, or rather what the temple does not provide for the people. And we see this back at the, in, chap, in Luke chapter 3, Acts chapter 3 rather, where Peter and John go up to the temple in the third hour, and of course they meet a lame man on the way, as you know from the song, I'm assuming that some of you sang this song at some point in your life. Peter and John went to pray, they met a lame man on the way. I tried this before when I talked about this passage, and I get blank stares. Nobody sings it. Does nobody sing this song anymore? One of the old classics. It's a, there's, a, there's a box setting to, to Peter and John. No, there isn't. But Okay, so Peter and John are going to pray, and they're going to the temple, and the temple is mentioned in the first six verses of chapter 3 of Acts. The temple is mentioned seven times, I think, it's mentioned repeatedly. It's mentioned, in almost, it's mentioned in almost every sentence and clause. The only place where it's not mentioned is in the little exchange between Peter and John and the lame man that, at the beautiful gate of the temple. But the temple setting is really important. You have this lame man sitting there begging for alms. Uh, alms in the Greek are root, uh, from the root for mercy. Kyrie eleison. It's a... When we sing the Kyrie, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Eleison is the word mercy, rooted in the word mercy. And the word for alms is mercy. You have this lame man sitting outside the temple, begging for alms, begging for coined mercy. And he's able to survive that. But he's at the beautiful gate of the temple, we're told. We don't know anything much about the beautiful gate of the temple, but we know that it was beautiful, which means that it was richly adorned. You've got this very wealthy temple, maybe gold and silver and gems on the temple, on the temple gate, this lame man sitting outside, and he has to beg. He's outside the temple, perhaps deliberately excluded from the temple. There's some evidence that Jews didn't allow lame people into the temple in the first century because they were considered to be defiled. By the law, they're not defiled. A lame man can't be a priest. A blind man can't be a priest. But there's nothing in the Torah that prevents a lame man from actually getting into the temple. But here you have a lame man who's probably deliberately excluded, and the temple gives him nothing. The temple doesn't provide any relief for him. The temple is impotent, certainly, to heal him. And even what the temple could provide... It doesn't, and the man is reduced to relying on the alms, the, the generosity of passers-by. And Peter and John come along. Peter doesn't have silver and gold, as the temple does. He doesn't say that, but the setting makes it clear that he's contrasting what he doesn't have with what the temple does have. I have no gold or silver. The temple does. I'm standing in front of this beautiful gate. I don't have any of that. But then Peter states the principle that I think governs the entire, uh, the entire life of the church uh, in the early chapters of Acts and throughout Acts. I, silver and gold I have none, but what I have I give you. If I have it, I have it for the sake of those who need it. Whether it's a spiritual gift, whether it's material goods, or whether it is, and as in this case, it's the name of Jesus... Peter and John have the name of Jesus not just to identify them and to elevate them. It does do that. But they have the name of Jesus in order to give the name of Jesus, in order to speak the name of Jesus with power and raise this man from being a lame man at the gate of the temple so that he can, here's the rest, here's the chorus, right? Walking and leaping and praising God. Okay. He's walking and leaping and praising God, not just standing up, but he's like one of the lame people in the prophecies of Isaiah, leaping back from exile, leaping over the threshold of the temple that he has probably never entered. This man has been given new life. This is like a resurrection. This is like new birth. He's been lame since birth. For the first time he can walk, for the first time he can leap, for the first time he can enter the house of God. And it's because Peter has offered this, what he has, he gives to the man. 
You have that contrast between a temple that's wealthy but is not sharing its wealth with those who genuinely need it and a new temple that is characterized by generosity. What I have, I give. We see that same kind of contrast in Acts chapter 6 when we have this dispute arise among the widows, among the Hellenistic Jews in Jerusalem and the Hebraic Jews, and they're disputing about the care of widows in the early church. The Hebrew widows seem to be favored in the distribution of, uh, of, uh, of wealth, of, of money, of charity. The Hebrew women are, the Hebrew widows are being favored over the Hellenistic widows, and there's a conflict, a grumbling in the church. But notice the background point here. There's a contest that the apostles resolve, but the important background point, the important premise, is that the church was caring for widows, which is exactly the opposite of what Luke has told us back in his gospel, exactly the opposite of what the temple system does. Acts chapter, uh, Luke chapter 21, I keep flipping between Luke and Acts inadvertently. Luke chapter 21, the widow's might. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting in their gifts into the treasure, and he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. For they out of all their surplus put in the offering, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. And while some of them were talking about the temple and it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, he says, as for these things you are looking at, the days will come in which there will not be one stone upon another which will not be torn down. Okay, we, we often hear about the widow's might as a, as, a, as a sign of her piety, which it certainly is. It's a sign of her sacrificial giving to the church. She's willing to give the last thing she has. But in the context, what's being highlighted is not the piety of the widow, but the abuse of the temple authorities. This is kind of the last straw for Jesus. And then he launches into the Luke version of the Olivet Discourse about the destruction of the temple. What sets Jesus off and what, in the context when Jesus says there will, uh, the, there will be uh, nothing, there will not be stone, one stone left upon another that will not be torn down. He says that in response to seeing this widow giving the last of her money to a corrupt temple elite instead of caring for the widow and distributing money from the temple to the widow, the temple elites are squeezing everything they can out of this poor widow. They devour widows' houses, as Jesus says elsewhere in the Gospel of Luke. That's the old temple, but not the new temple. The old temple devours widows. The new temple feeds widows. There's a conflict about how they feed them, but at least they're feeding them, which is what they're supposed to do. That's what the temple system is about. And all this context concerning this conflict between temples is important for understanding what's going on in Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. They bring their goods, as everyone else does. They bring the money that they get from the sale of the property to the apostles' feet, it's another temple reference. The temple of Israel is the dwelling place of the name. It's the house of Yahweh. It's the footstool of Yahweh. Yahweh is enthroned above the wings of the cherubim and the ark of the covenant beneath is his footstool. It's his place of rest. The Lord wandered through the wilderness with Israel. Whenever they set up camp and they took their rest from their wandering, the Lord took his rest and put up his feet on, his, on the Ark of the Covenant, his footstool. And then finally, when they entered the land and had rest in the land, the Lord took up permanent residence and his feet were up, uh, up uh, on the Ark of the Covenant. He was enthroned above the cherubim uh, in a permanent house. And when the temple was built, when the tabernacle was built, and the Lord had uh, been enthroned above the cherubim and put his feet on the, t on the Ark of the Covenant, people brought treasure. I uh, don't know if you have heard uh, Jamie Soule's song from Numbers 7 about the procession of treasure into the temple. 
Numbers chapter 7. Each tribe, tribal leaders, brings in uh, the exact same collection of treasures, bowls and uh, plates and gold and silver and other treasure that they're bringing into the temple. There's this great procession of treasure into the temple to lay it at the Lord's feet. And the same thing happens when the temple is built, even before the temple is built. First Chronicles tells us about David's uh, preparation for the building of the temple. He doesn't build the temple, of course, but he's preparing the work. He's, he's gathering and organizing all of the workmen. He's gathering all the materials that they will need. And he donates a huge amount of gold and silver and bronze to the temple. The nobles of Israel donate a huge amount of gold and silver and bronze to the temple. This is in 1 Chronicles 29. When the Lord is going to take his throne and his feet are going to rest on the Ark of the Covenant, then there's this procession of treasure into the temple so that the temple can be adorned. And the same thing is happening in the new temple. Now that the Spirit has consecrated the disciples as the new temple, the apostles are the ones enthroned in this new temple. And so treasure is brought to the feet of the apostles. People sell their land, people sell their homes, and they bring their treasure to the feet of the apostles, just like the procession of tribal elders in the book of Numbers, just like David and the nobles in 1 Chronicles 29. They're bringing this treasure because they're building a temple. In the old temple system, the temple that they were building was a temple of gold, silver, stone, bronze. The new temple is a living temple. And the treasure that is brought is there to adorn the living temple to ensure that all of the members of that living temple, all of the pillars and floorboards and wall ornaments of the living temple can contribute fully to the life and to the glory of that living temple. The treasure comes to the apostles not to build buildings, Treasure comes to the apostles in order to assist those who are needy within the church. Now this, I think, explains what's going on with Ananias and Sapphira. Because what they're doing is pretending and promising to give something to this living temple. They're giving, they say, the entire amount that they had received from their sale. They're giving that entire amount to the temple, but they're keeping part of it back. They claim to be bringing the entire amount to the apostles' feet, but they only bring a portion. Like Achan, they're committing an act of sacrilege. Their declaration, this is the pro- these are the proceeds of our sale, we're donating it to the Lord, that designates that as holy, holy goods. That's now for the use, and the use of the church is under the control and authority of the apostles to distribute as needed to the people in the church. And yet they hold some of it back. They hold back some of God's stuff, in other words, just like Achan did. Because they're supposed to be donating it to build up this temple, but instead they're keeping back part of it for themselves. Of course, Ananias and Sapphira are a negative example of a practice that's going on in the early church. Many of the disciples were doing what Ananias and Sapphira did, that is, selling property, selling houses, and then bringing the proceeds from those sales to the apostles for distribution to those who are in need. Many people are doing that. Ananias and Sapphira do it uh, badly. They do it sinfully because they don't give over the whole of what uh, what they claim to be giving over. That treasure is given in order to adorn the house of God. That is to adorn the living temple. It's given to uh, the church in order to uh, distribute. What I have, I give you. The congregation, Acts 4.32, the congregation of those who believed were one heart and one soul. And not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. If I have it, it's at your disposal. That's what Peter says to the lame man. That is the principle that's governing the use of wealth 
in the early church. Now, does this principle continue to apply throughout the centuries and history of the church? Many have pointed to unique features of the situation in Jerusalem in order to answer that question. No, this is, this is a unique situation. It's a crisis situation, and the church is addressing a particular crisis. And this doesn't set any kind of model for the church throughout its history. And it's true that there are unique features to the situation in Jerusalem. We know from Acts 2 that people came from every kingdom under heaven, every nation under heaven, to gather for the day of Pentecost. Then the Spirit was poured out. At least 3,000 people are baptized. Some proportion of those people don't live in Jerusalem. Some of them are now staying in Jerusalem, being part of the buildup and the foundation of the early church. They need to have some kind of support. And so in that situation, there's a, an emergency. We don't have enough money in the coffers. We don't have money in the, enough money in the bank account to care for all these visitors, these strangers, and so we want to care for them. That's true. That's a unique part of the situation here. Besides, many have pointed out, Jerusalem is doomed. They know Jerusalem is doomed. Jesus said Jerusalem is doomed. The temple is doomed. And so there's not much point in holding on to a real property in the city of Jerusalem when it's going to be destroyed within a generation. That's also true, and perhaps a consideration for some people. It's also true, importantly, that the apostles don't coerce anyone into selling houses or fields and giving them to the apostles. This is not a system where the apostles have a common purse. That is, it's not the case that everyone who becomes part of the church sells all of their property and turns all of their property over to the apostles, and the apostles are paying everyone's salary, as it were, and distributing all the wealth of the whole community. It can become centralized and distributed out to the apostles. That's not what it, what's happening. Peter makes that clear when he talks to Ananias. When it remained unsold, did it not remain within your control? Did it not remain your own? You could have decided not to sell. You're free to do that. And after it was sold... Was it not under your control? You could have sold it and you could have used it for some other purpose or you could have put, given a portion to the church and held back a portion for your own use. The problem is that they claimed that they were giving it all and they didn't. They lied. They claimed they were giving it all and by claiming they were giving it all, they designate all of it as God's stuff and then they held back a portion of God's stuff. That was the problem. Not the fact that they, had, that they sold and kept back. In some ways, the system that the apostles set up here is more difficult than a system that's kind of communal property where everyone sells everything and puts it into one common pot. Then all of the responsibility for making decisions about who gets what is put on the shoulders of the apostles. They have to make all the judgments. But in this case, in the way that the system actually works, uh, Every individual believer has to make his own decision. How much is too much? How much should I give? You have to make those balances. I've got my own family to take care of. Should I sell this property? I want to leave an inheritance to my children. Should I sell this property that could be my children's inheritance in order to care for this? You have to make those judgments. They're not taken out of the hands of individual members as they would be if this were just a common property system. All those things are true and are important in qualifying and understanding exactly what's going on here. And yet at the same time, I think that what the, uh, what the book of Acts is showing us is a constant of the church's life. It ought to be a constant of the church's life throughout the church's history. It's easy for us to dismiss this as just something that pertained to the church in Jerusalem and doesn't pertain to us. It, uh, I think... Uh, blunts the challenge of this passage. I think overall what Acts, the early chapters of Acts are showing us is that this is as much, this, this sharing of property is as much a part of the life of the church as such, not just the early church in Jerusalem, a part of the life of the church as such, as clinging to the apostolic preaching, as prayer, 
It's as much a part of the life of the church as sharing bread, breaking bread from house to house. Occasionally, Luke has these summary statements in the early chapters of Luke. He has these long descriptions of events that take place, and then he has these summary descriptions of what, is, what the church is doing in the meantime. And in two of those cases, he includes the sharing of property and the consideration that property is common property for the benefit of all. It's common wealth for the benefit of everyone. He includes that in the summary description of what the church is and what it's doing. Look at the end of Acts chapter 2. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place to the apostles. This is just after the events of Pentecost. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as many as had need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. It's not like you can extract their common property and their communion in goods from the rest of the things that they're doing. What does the church do, you might ask Luke? And he would say, well, the church does a lot of things. We listen to the apostles' teaching. We break bread together. We share common meals. We pray together. We have communion together. And part of that communion is a communion in wealth, a communion in goods. That is a summary statement of what the church is. And that's reinforced by the way that, uh, by the language that Luke uses here. Verse 42, I didn't read that part. They were continually devoting some, themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Fellowship is koinonia. Koinonia means uh, having, having a, it's a, it's a, a, a it's based on the, the word koinon, common. It's a sharing of things. The communion of the saints is sharing in holy things. Again, in the creed, that's what the, that's what the church is. It's a sharing in holy things. We have a common share of the spirit. We have a common share of the body of Christ. We're devoted to fellowship with one mind and one heart. Koinonia, and then in a couple verses later, they were all together and had all things in koinon. Koinonia in verse 42, koinon, all things in common, in verse 44. Their sharing of goods is part of the fellowship and communion that they have. The communion is, and fellowship is not just a matter of them, um, you know, chatting about football games at the end of church in the narthex. Nothing, nothing wrong with that. But the communion is a common share in the spirit a common share in the mission of the church, a common mind, a common clinging to the gospel as proclaimed by the apostles, and a common share in all the wealth that every member brings to the church. We even have a name to put with this practice. Joseph, the end of chapter 4. Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, he was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement. He owned a tract of land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. That's just before the account of Ananias and Sapphira. Joseph Barnabas, Barnabas is a, an anti-Ananias. He's the counterpoint, the foil to Ananias. He's a true Joseph, you know, the original Joseph. Collected, collected food and then distributed good in a time, time of need. And this Joseph is also distributing the proceeds from his sale. This, Joseph Barnabas is kind of a model disciple. He's, a, he's an exemplar of the church. He's a Levite. So he's descended from Levi, one of the tribes of Israel. But he's of Cyprian birth, and the language suggests that he's Cyprian by ethnicity. So he seems to be a convert, at least He's identified both as a Levite and by this Gentile location. He combines in his own person, Jew and Gentile. He's a son of encouragement, and he is a Levite indeed. He practices Levitical, uh, Levitically. Levites famously didn't have any share in the land. 
Their portion was the Lord himself, and that's the way Joseph Barnabas acts. The Lord is his portion. And what he has from the Lord, he distributes as there is need in the church. One last thing, the the distribution of goods across the church doesn't end with this situation in Jerusalem. There are particular unique features to the situation in Jerusalem, but it doesn't stop. Paul spends a good bit of his ministry collecting money from Gentiles in order to take it to Jews in Jerusalem who are suffering from famine. And Paul doesn't see this just as a matter of economic care or charity. He sees it as a matter of koinonia, of communion. The Jews have shared their spiritual goods with the Gentiles. Salvation is of the Jews. Jesus is of the Jews. The Jews brought all these treasures to the Gentiles and the counter gift that the Gentiles give in this exchange, this common exchange of gifts is to sacrificially give of their own material wealth to the Jews who have need. So what we find by in, in the, later in the book of Acts and in other uh, parts of the New Testament is not that this uh, Jerusalem uh, practice of sharing goods ends, but it's spread out over the whole empire. Gentiles who have never met the Jews in Jerusalem, who have never been to Jerusalem, are willing to give to Paul so that he can take those treasures to Jerusalem to relieve the famine. As long as there's a temple under construction, and the temple will be under construction until the last day, when the temple is fully complete, as long as there's a temple under construction, there should be a procession of treasure into the church in order to adorn the living temple of the church, and particularly to adorn those who are in themselves unadorned. Those, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, those who are considered shameful, we account more honorable. And they express that, not just in words, but they express that in their use of wealth by providing for those who are in need. And that includes the prospect and the willingness to give to those who are in need at great cost to ourselves. That's part of the practice of the church. That's part of the koinonia of the church. If we're a communion of saints, we're a communion of goods. And I think this has particular application to the place where we find ourselves culturally today. And this is, uh, fits with what things I've said in my earlier talks. As Aaron Wren has said, we live in a, a negative world. The church is no longer honored and respected. The church is greeted, treated with suspicion. The church is opposed. As I said yesterday, some of you are going to be put in positions where you're on trial, maybe not formal legal trial, but on trial before your supervisor at your job, on trial before your neighborhood, your neighbors, your friends about your convictions, your biblical convictions, and you're called to name the name of Jesus. And in that kind of situation, especially, Christians need to be ready to give radically, with radical generosity, that is willing to sacrifice our own goods, our own wealth, our own comforts. Because some people are going to lose their jobs because they stand for Christ. Some people are going to lose their retirements because they stand faithfully for Christ. Some people are going to have a hard time finding a job in their chosen field, in their chosen career, because they've become a pariah. Now, we can wish them, we can give them good Good, good wishes, be warmed and well fed, send them on. Or we as churches can be prepared to provide generous support for people who are going to need it. A bridge loan or a bridge gift from the church that allows somebody who has lost his job for his faithfulness to Christ 
to have six months until he can find a new job and begin to support his family again. That's going to happen. And churches need to be ready to provide that kind of assistance, and that will require this kind of generosity. In a situation of persecution, this kind of generosity is going to be especially important. Or even take a step back. Suppose you have a church member who is put on trial by his, by his employer, threatened with his job. You could lose your job if you don't buckle at this point. And he's got a choice. I could lose my job, lose my livelihood, not be able to support my family, and make this small compromise. It's one scenario. But what if he knew that his local church had his back? And there was a fund in the bank, in the church's bank account, precisely for this situation. That gives support, boldness. It supports the boldness that we're all called to. It gives practical support to that kind of boldness. Yes, we should be bold at, cost, at all costs. We should live by the audacity of the Spirit. But we have to live. <laughs> we have to support our families. And churches need to be ready to provide the kind of support that's necessary in those kinds of situations. We're called to this kind of communion in goods at every time, but especially in our time. The principle for us should be, as it was for Peter, what I have, I give. You have spiritual gifts. Every one of you has a gift from the Spirit. It's not just for you. And it's not to build yourself up. You have a spiritual gift so that you can use it to build up the church. And every one of you has material gifts. And those material gifts are also given to you for the sake of the building up of the body of Christ and the edification of the church. There's no difference in the principle. What we have, we've received. And what we have, we give. In the name of the Father and of the Son, in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Almighty God, our Father, we thank you for your generosity to us. We thank that you loved us before we loved you and you gave us riches beyond our comprehension. We thank you that you answer our prayers and give us far beyond all we can ask or imagine. And we pray that you would stir us up by your Spirit to show the same kind of generosity to those around us that we would bless and show mercy as we have been shown mercy, that we would give riches even as we have received riches. We pray that you would do this to build up your holy temple as a glorious house in the earth. We pray this for the sake of Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. Okay, we have a break till 1045, so we'll begin again at 1045.